Okay, so so this week is history of graphic design. If any of you have looked at the course uh, calendar, that is what we'll be reviewing this week. And the reason this is so important is because learning about the past helps us understand the present. It helps you predict trends and it just helps you understand where things are coming from. So your assignment this week, I think is really fun. It's one of my favorite assignments to see what you all come up with. And it is designer's choice. You can make it in any program you want to. You can use Photoshop, you can use Illustrator, or you could actually do it by hand if you'd like and like scan it or take a picture of it and submit it. So you can get to your end result however you feel will be best. And we'll go over that in more detail as we move on. So I know there's probably some questions about the assignment since so few of you turned it in. A lot of that is probably because of the glitch in the video and you didn't have that resource. So I have fixed that and I'm giving you till Monday. So if you have um, questions about how to do that, I know Ariane specifically mentioned the masking in Photoshop was a little tricky and it can be a little tricky if you've never done that before. So we'll go over that at the end and jump into the lecture. Does that sound good? Anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay. All right. So without further ado, we will go into the history of graphic design. Let me get to the module here and then I will screen share. <clears throat> So the module this week has some links and it has a video. We will not, well, maybe I will play that and comment over it. This is a very dry video. I actually watched several other videos today to see if there was a better one. And this one just covers all of the points I'd like to cover. You don't have to remember names. You don't have to remember years. It just has some good key historical markers in it, um, but it is a very dry video. It's like not super fun or interesting. So I will try to jazz that up when we get to that point. You do have a discussion, so don't forget to do your discussion. And then you'll have an assignment, which is I called it assignment four. It's really project four. So this is a full on creative project. I should edit that. And I will after class, I'll make myself a note. Um, it's not an assignment where you just have to follow the steps. It's a very creatively driven project. And the goal is to show me that you understand these broad concepts. Um, okay. And we're also going to be talking about how to critique and talk about design. This will be very important next week for, um, I'd say second real critique, because we really critiqued project one with your posters. Um, and then some of these other projects didn't really need a solid critique because they are um, like the typeface is real creatively free. And, um, but this one will go back to critiquing, like, is it communicating what you want it to communicate? Can we understand why you made these decisions and things like that? So I always like to talk about critique as a general concept. A uh, good critique is not just about finding faults. So I hope when we're critiquing each other and I'm critiquing you, you don't think that I'm just pointing out the flaws. Um, the judgments we form can, can and should cover both positive and negative aspects of the work. So a lot of people have different critique styles. They'll do like the sandwich method where it's like something good, something bad, something, something good. So people feel good about the way that they're being critiqued. Um, I really like the way Tim Gunn critiques things. If you've ever watched Project Runway, he has a really interesting technique of like asking questions to make the designer get to where he's, what he's thinking. Um, but there's always a good way to deliver criticism or talk about the design. And um, the best way to critique something is to fall back on those principles and elements and really know uh, concepts and why things should be the way that they are so that you can have a good discussion about whether these choices were good or bad. As critics, we should strive for fairness, honesty, and empathy. With this attitude, critique starts to look a lot more 
like a, a creative task rather than a destructive one. So I hope you know we don't do these critiques to tear anyone down or to make anyone feel bad. It's all to make your design improve along the way. When a critique is well done, it one, identifies the strength of the work and two, helps to improve the weaknesses of the work. Three, helps our professional development and four, enhances mutual trust and collaboration. Five, ultimately it helps the entire profession like design to advance and grow. In short, critique matters because it enables us to improve our work. So, and then this is a link that I found on improving your critique skills that I thought was really good. But I always like to cover this, uh, especially this week, before we get into our critiques next week, um, just to help us all understand why we're doing this. Um, again, it's not to tear anyone down or to criticize. Uh, when I was in school, some of the critiques that we did were, were just like when I first started, we had to bring in our projects printed out. They were all up on the board next to each other. And it just felt so <laughs> like you'd feel so anxious about it. Um, I'll never forget, I was in a class with mostly seniors, and we had to put up our personal branding projects, and then critique each other's, and the person that stood up in front of mine stood there for like, it felt like 10 minutes to me, but now thinking back, it may not have been that long, but they just stood there, looked at it, didn't say a thing, and after what to me felt like 10 minutes, they said, I don't really like it and then sat down and I was like horrified. I worked so hard on it. I thought it was awesome. Seeing that other person's work, we had completely different aesthetics. So I don't expect this particular person to like it, like they would like something that was for them, but you still have to be able to analyze it in terms of, is this good design or not? You don't have to like everything like it's for you, but you do have to be able to understand if it's good or bad. Does that, does that make sense? So I hope we never have that. It's clearly I'm still thinking about it because that was 20 years ago and I still can remember that moment. So I don't want any of you to have an experience like that in this class, but I want you to understand why, we're, why we critique and talk about design. And then jumping back to history, these historical styles and concepts and learning why things have evolved and why we have communication the way we do from cave paintings to now where everything's practically digitally based. Um, it's important to know that so that when you're looking at new designs or you're looking at new work, you can analyze it with, with that brain. <laughs> That's so me. You all relate to my, my story. That was a that was the worst critique I ever had. Most of them were good, but we actually had to do peer critique and I still haven't forgotten about that person. And I went to school in Fresno and that person was from Bakersfield also. And I don't know what they're doing now. I should look them up, but I'm sure she forgot about it. And I'm still thinking about it to this day. So we have to be nice to each other during critiques is my point. So I'm going to jump into my PowerPoint here. All right, so why study graphic design history? I dedicate a full week to this topic and I think it's really important for the context and the connection to people who did the same work as you do now. So knowing what came before you. Design history is an education in what's considered the best design has offered through the years. So we look at a, like hundreds of years and we just pick the highlights and kind of analyze them to see. So we do this to build a visual vocabulary and recognize how design elements are used and organized to learn to see rather than to simply look. I know that sentence always seems weird, but you have to see it rather than look. So you're just looking at something or are you actually seeing what it's composed of, all of the individual elements, how it's put together. And then also, I love number three, it's just to acquire good taste. And who's really to say what's good taste and bad taste, right? We all have different aesthetic. We all like 
have different preferences. We like different colors. We like different fonts, things like that. But there is a general understanding of what's good and bad design and seeing the more design you see, the more you will know what is good and bad. It strengthens your communication skills. You become a better designer. You appreciate the past, be inspired by the present and anticipate the future. Other designers know design history and they're your competition. So it's just important to know this because this is what other design students are knowing and doing. They have to take, if it's someone who's in a full comprehensive design program, they have probably taken one class solely based on the history of graphic design. And we don't have that same kind of design program here, but you can still know and understand some of the history. So it cultivates your curiosity and to recognize that design is one of the oldest of human pursuits and it is not the result nor reliant on computer technology. So this is what I think is really fascinating too about history of graphic design is that we have been designing communication visually for years. Um, and you just don't see it the same way because it's not sitting down at a computer and using programs to understand what good design is and why it's important. So that is the whole reason this is why we're here this week. And I hope that helps you understand the history of graphic design. Okay, so now we're gonna get into each of these a little bit more. To acquire good taste, you develop taste by de for design by observing and thinking about design. The more designs you see, the better you can separate good design from bad. Design history gives you more to compare, which helps you recognize more patterns and sort designs into good and bad and not sure. Design history is told through the work and ideas of designers considered among the best and those that move design forward through significant contribution. Therefore, design history is an education in what's considered good design. So if any of you have taken a lot of art classes, you might have taken art history. And we do the same thing in art history as well. When there's a new concept or someone comes out and changes something in the field, um, that's always worthy of being studied. Appreciate the past, be inspired in the future, in the present, and anticipate the future. So want to create a timeless design, you need to know what, has stand, what stands the test of time. If you want to keep up with the trends, trends come and go and then come back again. It's very cyclical. Uh, we talked about this a little bit with color theory and things like that. Very little, if anything, is wholly original. Most of what's done today is inspired by something that was done in the past. Odds are, if it was popular once, it will be popular again. Fashion is like this, um, pretty much a lot of trends cycle back and you'll see things um, come back that used to be trendy or popular. Uh, fashion I always look to because it's like I was raised in an era that's coming back right now. So it's so easy for me to visually see those connections. Um, so why do trends go away? The typical pattern is for something to become popular before growing too popular and then becoming tiresome. A new trend emerges often in reaction to the previous one. So it's almost always a reaction. This is what's popular. This is what's being done. I'm going to do something different. And then it cycles around and around. Let the past inspire your present and let it help you understand how to design for a timeless future. So now I'm going to go over a a uh, couple different historical styles that we'll jump into the project. So illuminated manuscripts, these are um, some of the first graphic designs and they are intricate books that were hand drawn and written. I should have played the video first now that I'm looking at this because it would make more of a historical context, but this is important for your assignment. So I'll go through the PowerPoint, we'll go to the video and then we'll delve further into the assignment. So just kind of look at these. Do you see patterns between these three, um, these three pictures? There's some repetition. There's some connection here. Everything has a frame. It's very intricate. It's got a certain color palette. These are the things I want you to point out and start recognizing when you're looking at a historical style. What is similar among all of these? This is Art Nouveau. So Art Nouveau is an international philosophy and style of art, architecture, and applied art, especially the decorative arts that were most popular in the 1890s to 1910. Got something in the chat. Let me check that. Oh, pretty. <laughs> yeah, I was just acknowledging that these are all really pretty styles. Well, so far, I haven't <laughs> seen more than these two, but 
<laughs> I've always wondered what they were called and stuff. So that's good to know. Oh yeah. So Art Nouveau is one that you'll see people draw upon inspirationally quite often because it is, it's so distinctive and it is really pretty. Um, okay, so there's many different names in other countries. A reaction to the academic art of the 19th century. It was inspired by natural forms and structures, not only flowers and plants, but also curved lines. Oops. Architects tried to harmonize with natural environment. So this is ba Bauhaus. Um, now this style has a, so let me jump forward. And then we have postmodernism. The reason I have slides for these four is because these are the four that I want you to consider for your project. Now, if I jump back to Bauhaus, to me, these look very different, but students always get them mixed up. This is very clean, very, everything is on a grid. So if you look at something like this, you should be able to place a grid, even if that grid is shifted and see where everything kind of lines up and falls. Now, postmodernism is the opposite. It's almost like the grid's thrown out the window and some things are just kind of all over the place. And it's a really free, um, interesting style. It can have that grunge look too. It doesn't necessarily have to be grunge, but it can, you definitely see a lot of um, collage, uh, layered typography, layered photographs. Um, David Carson is a very popular graphic designer who's been, you know, that some of you might have heard of. And he um, has a lot of that grunge style of, of design. So these are the tips for starting your project. I want you to pick your topic first. And I didn't go over the project, so that would make more sense. What we're going to be doing is making a historical poster, um, but you're going to pick a modern issue. So you're going to pick something that applies to today, and you're going to pick one of those historical styles and design your poster in a historical style for a modern issue. So the best way to go about that is to pick your topic first. And select something that matters to you, because if you care about it, it'll just show more in your design. I've had students really struggle with topic selection, so we will brainstorm together and think about what we can do. Um, I looked back at a lot of old assignments today, and it's just like, I don't want to say it's depressing, but it's the state of our world over the last few years has really made this poster easy. Um, to pick something, but last semester I felt like we needed a little bit of relief, so I shifted the assignment and they just weren't as good. This assignment is much better this way when we pick a modern topic and then uh, add a historical style to it. So pick something that matters to you and we'll brainstorm. It can be anything uh, from like this example here is uh, for like the earth and planet, climate change, things like that. Um, or it can be, you know, anything and everything. We'll go over that. Then I want you to select the historical style. Oops, I went too far. Once you do that, I want you to make sure it can work within your skill set. And this example here, if you're wondering what this is, this is an example from a past semester student. This is what the student turned in. And they admittedly said, I just got in way over my head. Students always love Art Nouveau. It's beautiful, especially if you want to use a feminine form or you want to use anything floral. You pick this style and it can be very, very difficult to execute. There's a lot of um, complexity to it. And so it's very easy to start and then end up with something like this. And then um, after talking about it and after the critique and the student was very brave and still submitted their assignment and still participated in the critique, but admittedly, they said, I was just in over my head. And so I like to show you what they turned in and then the second attempt, because like I say, if you ever feel like you are unhappy with your grade or something didn't work out the way you wanted to the first time, you can always take a second shot at it. And this was the second attempt and it's a much, cleaner, better execution. And what the student ended up doing was they were trying to draw it in um, like a tablet. 
And you can see here, the student's actually a good draw, uh, illustrator, and she drew the woman and then layered it over a found image and kind of composited her end result to give her something that was just a lot cleaner and better to execute than what was originally her attempt. So I'd just like to show everybody that. Now let's dive into the, let's go to the video, which I already have up here. And I'm, I'm gonna, I might pause it and talk over the top of it to clear up some points. So play. You can tell by that music that it's gonna be exciting, right? Can you also- Through the beginning of time, humans have desired to communicate from the cave paintings of Lascaux to the designs of Banksy and La Force, the evolution of visual literacy has emerged. Early human markings called petroglyphs consisted of carved and painted figures, animals, and signs represented spoken language. Around 3100 BC, Sumerians settled in Mesopotamia and began drawing petroglyphs and clay tablets, which represented abstract ideas. These symbols, called cuneiform, were combined to form words and phrases. The Egyptians also had their own version of writing, hieroglyphics, as well as they developed papyrus for writing on. Using papyrus, the Egyptians combined words and pictures to produce illustrated manuscripts. Okay, so just a quick pause right there. You already see that visual communication has been around a long time. Cave paintings were the perfect example, and then it gets into Egyptian hieroglyphics. So humans just have this need to communicate, and you'll see as technology develops, the way we communicate changes. As time went on, cuneiforms and hieroglyphics evolved into alphabets. These alphabets varied slightly between cultures. The Latin and Greek alphabets were combined to create the alphabet we use today. Substrates for writing also evolved from papyrus to parchment made from animal skins. Calligraphy and other lettering styles began developing, which led into typography. Woodblock printing became popular in Asia, in which designs were carved out of wood and then printed onto paper. Playing cards were some of the earliest prints and eventually evolved into black books. Johann Gutenberg revolutionized bookmaking by creating the printing press. Copper plate engraving began allowing all people to buy art. The Renaissance brought about early logo designs, illuminated letters and new typefaces. Many fonts that were created during this time are still used today. Renaissance designers liked floral decoration, which is seen in many forms of art, including prints. During the Industrial Revolution, graphic communications became widely available with new technologies. Friedrich Koning designed a steam-powered press, which allowed high-speed printing. Artists Walter Crane and Randolph Caldcutt developed toy books for children. Magazines and periodicals were created to inform the people and photography was invented as a new communications tool. George Eastman created the Kodak camera in 1888, allowing the public to document their lives. The arts and crafts movement began as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. The Century Guild emerged among other societies and guilds consisting of artists and designers. They created the Hobby Horse, which was the first printed magazine devoted solely to the visual arts. Books became an art form. The Guild created the bridge between the arts and crafts movement and Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau was an international decorative style that was in all aspects of designer arts. Art Nouveau forms and lines were invented rather than copied from nature. I like that line there. Um, and it talks about the industrial revolution. So again, anytime something gets pushed really far one way, it's just always seems to be the trend that it's going to swing back. So in the industrial revolution, more machines, more mechanical things were being very technical. Um, it's funny to think about that now, now knowing what we can do as a society. But the response to that was this Art Nouveau style that has very organic curved lines things that machines just can't make the same way. And the, the forms in these designs were invented. So 
it's not like people were looking at nature and seeing like, I'm going to draw a tree like a tree looks. They're going to draw a tree the way they want the tree to look in this crazy style with these fluid lines. There's a huge fantasy element in all of it. Artists such as Charest, Grissat, Beardsley, and Toulouse-Lautrec became popular during this time. As the 20th century began, artists searched for new ways to express themselves. Artists like Wright, McDonald, Macintosh, Hoffman, and Behrens, among others, developed new styles and influences for today's designers. Decorative, product, book, and poster design, as well as trademarks, architecture, and font design, exploded with creative revolutions that altered the role of art and design in society. Visual communication was influenced further by cubism, data and surrealism, to still constructivism and expressionism movements. Ideas about color, form, space, and subject all focused around social protest and deeply personal emotional states. Posters became important to communication as World War I progressed and the government used them for visual persuasion and propaganda. Art Deco posters were elegant and sophisticated while constructivist posters were more geometric with strong typography. The Distill movement started in the Netherlands and reduced the elements of book design to the primary colors and straight lines. Ideas from various art and design movements were combined and applied to the problems of functionality and machine production at a German design school called Bauhaus. Many modern type fonts were produced at the Bauhaus. With the popularity of the modern art movement in America, magazine design flourished. Bazaar, View, and Vogue were inspirations for other magazines in the US. Advertisements for everything from food to furniture led the country into the age of information. A series of new fonts were developed, including Universe, Arial, and Helvetica. Many European designers immigrated to the U.S. to escape their political climate and became major influences in American design. New York became the center of the movement in the 1940s. Emphasis was placed on the expression of ideas and presentation of information. Artists like Rand and Bass designed many well-known company logos, such as UPS, IBM, Girl Scouts, and United Way, to help relate to diverse audiences. The MTV logo was designed, redefining visual identity in the digital age. A new conceptual approach to illustration dawned as Glazer, Trast, Sorrell, and Ruffins founded Pushpin Studios in 1954. Together, they created the Pushpin Almanac, a newsletter for graphic designers that united illustration with typography and design. Poster design became popular in the 1960s and 70s, highlighting everything from social activism to hippie life. During the 1980s and 90s, the development of electronic and computer technology began to change the processes and appearance of design. Postmodern design expressed a climate of cultural change and artists began to explore the range of design possibilities. New Wave Typography, the Memphis Group, Retro Design, the Electronic Revolution, Supermannerism, and Supergraphics all formed out of postmodernism. Designers began using bold geometric shapes of bright color, varied scale and typeset at unusual angles, focusing on historical revival and technical expression. The digital revolution changed visual communication even further. Digital technology and advanced software expanded the creative potential of graphic design. Apple Computer developed the Macintosh computer, Adobe Systems invented the PostScript program, and all this created PageMaker. Digital type took place of calligraphers and hand letterers, digital imaging replaced film cameras, and computer communications took a huge leap forward with the development of the internet. The graphic design community is now involved in media graphics, systems design, and computer graphics. The need for clear and imaginative visual communications has never been greater. Graphic designers have a responsibility to adapt new technology and continue inventing new ways of expressing ideas. The end.
All right, so that is that. That is a really good synopsis covering a whole lot of time in history. Um, you can watch it again, it's linked in the module. Um, but that'll give us a good overview. I probably should have played that before I went through the PowerPoint. I'm not sure what would have been best. But now you know the PowerPoint helps you understand why you have to know all of these things. So a few things from the video, it does cover all of the historical styles that will be in your assignment. And um, I just wanna point out, if you would like to do something different, let me go to the assignment. So I list them here, you have these four choices. If there is something different you would like to do, you can um, just check it with me first, but I'll, I'll probably say yes if you have a good reason. Um, there's other styles that I didn't list. I picked these four because they, they, I think that they are distinctively different. Um, and they're easy to break down the stylistic parts and compose into something. There's also things like Art Deco. It mentions constructivism. Uh, it mentions the World War I and World War II posters. So if there's a style like that that you're really drawn to, we could also go by decades, which I tried last semester to do like, like 60s style, 50s style. But again, when I shifted this assignment last semester, I just didn't think it was as strong as it could have been. Um, so yeah, I want you to think of it, it's not just like decades or trends, it's, um, it's a movement. So these are all design styles that were significant movements in throughout history. So there's probably one that you're already drawn to stylistically, and then you can pair that with your topic of choice. So just to go over the assignment, you choose one of the historical design periods listed below as a style for a modern informational poster. So you're going to be making an informational poster that has some kind of message to communicate. You're gonna pick a topic and you want to communicate your pretty much your opinion on this topic or what message you wanna send. So the poster should clearly communicate your viewpoint on a current issue while reflecting a style from the past. Use any technical or creative means to achieve the desired result. Again, any program or by hand, you get to decide that's what makes this project so fun. If you feel like your technical skills in the programs are not up to speed yet, then um, you can do these styles by hand, like illuminated manuscripts were actually done by hand. But you can also uh, recreate these things in the computer as well. So tip, be thoughtful about your font choices. Do not make text an afterthought. These styles have historical fonts and things like that that go with them. So make sure you're pairing your font choices with something that fits with your overall design. Uh, make sure you use fonts that are appropriate for the time period you select. So you can go to places, you can search your Adobe fonts. I showed you how to do that. You can also go to sites like defont.com. I'm pretty sure I can type Art Nouveau in the search. I always forget how to spell it. <laughs> Where, like where the E's are and where the O's and the U's. Yeah, it wasn't close. You don't have to learn how to spell these days. That's what computers are for. Yeah, see, they have a font that's called Art Nouveau. So you can even borrow things like this, which are these are like the, the glyphs that we learned how to use in uh, our type lesson, you can use these, you can outline them, you can blow them up and break them apart. And just like the typeface, you can pick parts out of them if you want. So again, know what you're capable of as a designer and work within that skill set. You can also do this on Adobe and you can do this in um, on this site. I just like this site, it has a lot of really, uh, decorative display font. So you could search if you're doing like illuminated manuscript, there are, there should be, what would be, calligraphy is on here somewhere, but I like the way it breaks things up into category. Oh, right here, calligraphy. And so a lot of it's like more fun, modern calligraphy, but 
you can just search around and see what fits and look at lots of examples of that subject. So going back to the assignment, the purpose of this project is to learn how to visually break down a style or a design and use it as inspiration. How do you take inspiration from something and make it your own? So that is the trick any artist needs to know how to do. Um, when you're in school and you're learning things, copying can be really great because it gets that in your head and helps things become more intuitive for you later down the line. When I was in school, one of my assignments in my painting class was to copy a master painting. And by the end of that copy, you're analyzing it inch by inch and knowing where those strokes went and you have a whole different appreciation for the color theory, for the mixing, for the shapes and everything that goes into that. So breaking down a historical style and analyzing it and distilling it into your own work will help do the same thing. So pay close attention to color, shapes and use of typography, images and how they can all come together. Begin with sketches, sketch, 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 brainstorm topics and research the historical style. So once you pick one of these, Google it, see what you can find um, and start looking at a lot of examples of it. And again, if you want to do something that is not listed, just send me an email or ask me after class if something else is really drawn to you or you have an idea that you want to do that's different than these. These are four really great ones. They're very distinctive and I am giving you a starting point, but you always have the choice to broaden this or to really make it something that you feel is best for you. So this PDF here, you can download it and I have it pulled up. I think, oh, I closed it. Here it is. So this PDF I made to show you all what it looks like to use a historical style for something that's modern. So you'll see here, illuminated manuscript. Obviously this dinosaur illustration is not from a real illuminated manuscript, but notice the similarities of this content. There's the frames, there's the color palette, um, just the elevation of something as that's like dinosaurs and you're making it look very um, fancy for lack of a more <laughs> fancy word. <laughs> um, you're adding lots of decorative elements just for the sake of decoration. So this is what I mean about analyzing the style. Art Nouveau is the second fanciest one, if you will, in this group. And these are historical illustrations. And then here, we have two examples in more modern settings. So this is a work by Shepard Fairey, who is a really amazing street artist. And there's always lots of framing in, in their work that reminds me of these Art Nouveau. See the similarities, the round shape, the repetition, but then all of the organic elements to it. And then this poster for Lana Del Rey is, look at the hair. The hair is the obvious one for this Art Nouveau style when you start looking at historical periods. And again, the circular, the framing, and then the typography in both of these mimics that look. And then I think this one's really funny. This is a Bauhaus poster, and this is a Burger King style <laughs> done in the same way. But see how the elements are repeated here. Uh, there's definitely a color palette. It's a lot of primary colors. So if you choose this style, again, pay attention to the colors. Don't start using pinks and purples and lime greens. It's definitely primary colors mixed with neutrals. And look at a lot of examples. Um, again, this has a very rich, uh, sophisticated color palette, lots of gold or things that mimic gold, things that mimic parchment and, and just like bright blues and reds. Um, Art Nouveau has a lot of color options, but again, it kind of looks muted, but the Shepherd Fairy example is a good indicator. You don't have to hit every point. Like this is a limited color palette, but it's still obvious connection. So when you do your critique next week and I ask you to explain it, 
you don't have to hit every single point, but there has to be a strong connection. And then postmodernism. So this is a poster by Paula Shear. And I have a whole link on her in the module because I think she's a really great designer to study. And then this is an NBA style poster that definitely mimics that look where type is fit in. There's like puzzle pieces going on. You can see the connection and the inspiration between these two pieces. So I hope that helps you get the idea of how you can take something that's old and use it for something that's modern. Like I said, I think this is a really fun assignment. I love seeing what you do. Um, this, these are eight examples and I put two from each time period here. Let me zoom in. So these are actual students work and uh, students love to use Art Nouveau for women's issues. It's the most feminine one. They always make that connection. Um, I really liked this one as well. Uh, thanks to COVID, a fun technique is to take something historical and add masks to it now to get that instant like modern and old connection. Um, so, you know, you have that as an option and you can also see the wide variety of topics here. So this one is a very simple uh, Bauhaus style for Save the Oceans, like very general, um, it's not, you know, like it's not COVID related. Um, so you have, you know, anything and everything is up for grabs here as far as subject matter. This illuminated manuscript one, I think it's really interesting when students take things and juxtapose them together. So uh, taking an issue like homeless and using it for illuminated manuscripts. So it doesn't just have to fit as like, oh, this goes with this. Sometimes the dissonance between the style and the topic is what can make something really interesting as well. So this homeless poster is a really good example of that, using something that's so ornate and opulent and taking, and for things like, you know, it was primarily used for religion and things like that. And then twisting that and using it to make a, a poster on homelessness is very creative. Um, this one is really, this student was very advanced. Let me begin by saying this. This was one of my more advanced students who had taken a lot of design classes. And this is a really great example of postmodernism. And there's tons of layering going on here. And it's very detailed, but it's a really great executed poster. So don't get intimidated by something like this. Um, but I still have to show it. It's, it's a really great example. And that one's um, on, you know, violence against animals. Uh, this one was created, unfortunately, when there were all the attacks on Asian people in our country. And again, it's a postmodern style. And I thought it was executed really well, uh, layering the flag and the type and the image of the person. Um, and this was done uh, right around that time. So that's why last semester I thought maybe everybody needs a break. See how some of these are really heavy, like it's a weird time. So last year we did, or last semester, we switched it and I let everyone do movie posters. But again, I just didn't think they were as impactful as picking something that's topical and timely and that you feel like, you know, so I know it's tough times, so I hope you don't feel like this is too heavy and rather use this as an opportunity to get that out and express yourself. So we have, um, this one is a COVID one. I always forget what Isaiah 4110 is, but again, it just shows you it's that, um, you know, taking something that's old and then putting that mask on it made it modern. And I don't get a lot of students choosing illuminated manuscripts, so I don't have a lot of examples. And then the first couple semesters, these were actually printed out. So, um, and then I think this Black Lives Matter poster is also a really great example of Bauhaus and using the colors. Um, and it's also really beautifully done. So you'll see that this style here is, I'll use the word simple or maybe, the better word is minimal. Um, so again, but you have to understand the style. So don't pick this one just because you think this is the simple one and this is what I know I can do. Make sure you understand the style if you're going to pick Bauhaus. Um, 
And then again, Art Nouveau, it's a classic case of, oh, that's so pretty. I want to do that one. And then it's just, <laughs> the student is drowning. It's very difficult. So um, if you are really drawn to a style, but you're not sure how you're going to execute it, we can talk about it. If um, you have your topic and you're not sure which one fits, we can talk about that too. I want to give us a lot of brainstorming opportunity uh, in this class session. So I'm just catching up on the chat. Yeah, and Danielle had mentioned that it's uh, easy to notice similarities, but hard to put words to exactly what they are. So that's where you can fall back to what we've done so far in the class period. And that's why this lesson comes after we've had typography color theory and principles and elements of design. So notice things like repetition, um, negative space, um, you know, all of those things, shape, color. Uh, and then like I had mentioned a couple times, typography is really important. Um, I'd like to put you in breakout rooms so you can brainstorm your topics and then we can talk about that as a whole, Corey. I just had a quick question. I think there was somebody, sorry, I think I skipped out there. I just had a quick question. Um, I think there was somebody that you were mentioning while you were talking about postmodernism. I think his name was Carson something. David and Carson. David Carson, that's what it was. Um, I just wanted to, to get his name down so I could research his stuff because I think I want to do something in that time frame. So I just wanted to. Yeah, I put it in the chat. Yeah, um, I'll look that up while you send this out. There is, does anyone know what masterclass is or have a masterclass account? He has a masterclass, but I've heard from other designers, it's disappointing <laughs> because you expect it to be like really great. And then he's just like talking about himself. Um, but he has a very, very distinctive style and it's deconstructed and it's kind of, you know, the first person to do anything is always really, I can't see it. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it blurs cause you have your blur on. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a very distinctive style. He's not in my, um, PowerPoint. I prefer, I always put polish here and there instead. <laughs> so yeah, so I want to put you in breakout rooms so you can brainstorm in small groups and then we'll brainstorm as a big group on topics. Not that there is any shortage of poignant topics you can pick, but some students just have a hard time. It's hard to commit to something. It's hard to say, this is what I wanna do. Um, you know, so if any of you are feeling like that, we'll do a quick five minute breakout room and then we'll talk about topics and then we can uh, brainstorm a little bit on how to relate those together. So here we go. Waiting on a few rooms still. Need that horse. <laughs> Parking up. <laughs> All right, now welcome back. I think we've got everyone. So, was that helpful, or did you all get in there and say, "What were we supposed to talk about"? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I feel personally attacked. Um. <laughs> <laughs> because you said that. <laughs> uh, it's good to have like small groups so you feel like you can talk to each other too instead of just, you know, all sitting here listening to me. So um, I try to do a breakout at least one, once per class session. So I think that was a good way to help everybody brainstorm and start thinking about what you want to do. Um, like I said, it's, it's, there's no shortage of hot topics. So what were some of the things? Let's start with room one. You can nominate a speaker or, um, or I'll kind of chime in. What were some of the things that you brought up? 
I forgot my group number. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Never mind. So room one is Danielle, Jacob, Lysander, and Paige. I could volunteer as tribute. So <laughs> I'm all looking at like other things like I know, everyone's all related hello, to yeah, you're do not it. going into the hunker games, dude. Like <laughs> right. So um we all kind of we're thinking about different styles so far. A lot of us like stop for, for a second. We're like, wait, where were the different ones? And trying to figure out, okay, like I'm thinking I'm going to go in this direction. Like mm -hmm. I, I still really like the Art Nouveau. I know it's going to be hard, but I think I'm going to use this to try to learn Fresco because the iPad uh, Adobe Sketch is gone. So now it's Fresco. So I'm going to be like, mm -hmm. I want to try and figure that out. So, uh, and then I, we all were trying to figure out different things. Um, oh, we did want to ask whether or not we could use some of the other stuff as a basis. Cause I've mentioned how I'm like, Oh, the, like, uh, the one where we did like multiple, like simple designs. I'm like, Oh, if you're doing art nouveau, you could probably use this as like a base for layers. And then like, um, Lysander, I think you were saying like, Oh, the face face one, right. Or what were you saying? yeah um like uh it, it it doesn't look like i spent like three and a half hours on it but um yeah like i was thinking about like using like like the face that i did of like one of mine and then kind of like kind of just building on that kind of going more or if we have to kind of like start you know kind of start new like if there was something like we really kind of like gravitated to could we do that or yeah so you can always pull from past assignments as a starting point as long as it makes sense for what you're doing and it satisfies all of the assignment specifications. So if there's something in a past assignment that you really feel like you can pull from, you absolutely can. So um, yeah, and you can also borrow from other things. If you're gonna use something like a tablet to actually draw, you can pull in images like, don't feel like you have to create everything from scratch. Like feel free to get a historical picture and like start drawing over the top of it and then making your edits where you see fit if you're doing something like Art Nouveau or Illuminated Manuscript. Um, Bauhaus is probably one that like, you're gonna have to use the computer <laughs> because it's so rigid that unless you're gonna get out your straight edges and really like toil over that by hand, that one's definitely computer-based. But postmodernism, I've even had students like actually collage by hand and pull from magazines and things like that. So as long as we can all tell what your topic is and we can tell what your historical style is, this is fully creative freedom. Does that help? No, a ton. Yeah. Um, and in fact, like I was going to ask you, cause, uh, like, uh, I always get stuck like, uh, finding stuff. So like, if we like find like a stock photo online, we can use it. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah perfect. So that, that example that I showed you from the student, I said was very advanced. Um, I'm sure like that was all pulled from stock imagery. He wasn't drawing that picture of that kitten or that like image of that elephant. He was just advanced enough to know how to pull from resources and to make it all look uh, cohesive. So just be aware of how to make everything fit together, but you can use stock images. You can, um, you know, obviously you don't have to create these fonts. You can download fonts that fit and things like that. If you uh, use any stock image, uh, do you need to like have some sort of uh source or what have you to make sure that it's referenced or you're just so saying you you don't have to reference it if you want to just put it in your assignment like listed you can you don't have to reference it if but i might ask and then it has to be or at least show have it show in the layers yeah yeah i just want you to change it in some way so don't just take like um one example that's been used multiple times and I've seen different variations of it. I'm always hesitant to say these things because then it's like, oh, that's what I was gonna do. So maybe I won't say it, but I get a certain style and a topic almost every semester. And the imagery is very familiar because these it's something that's done a lot. <laughs> now it's making it weirder. Let's go through the groups and then maybe I'll talk about that. I want to hear more of your ideas. And I don't want to like 
pollute any of your ideas with things that past students have done. So um, we're kind of jumping around, but as far as like topic and subject matter, do you feel confident about that room one? Like, you know what you're going to do in room two. So that would be Ashley, Brianna, Corey, and Daniela. Do you have any? I talked about mine. So if you guys want to talk about yours. Go ahead, Corey. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to do something about the whole Russia war going mm -hmm. on. Um, and I was kind of thinking about doing the postmodern uh, design timeline. And then I thought of the movie Atomic Blonde and the whole graphics of, I don't know if you guys are all familiar, if you'd like me to share my screen, I've got just some kind of images from it, but it's like that neon contrasted color type of, um, like Eastern European, like gray, everything else, but then the really neon signs, but the whole movie is kind of like that. And so making, uh, making some kind of postmodernism graphic with that, uh, with Russia's conflict, since it's also kind of comparative because if it goes back to the Cold War times with their graphic, then same, same. Cool. You have a really solid idea, then that's great. Thank I, you. I'm not like, that is so poignant and what's happening right now that if everybody was like that's what I was going to do for a topic I would not be surprised and that's perfectly acceptable and we'll still get 15 different posters out of everybody so I just want to say that in case anybody's like ah oh, he said it and now I can't do it it there's always something big that happened cool. happening so I like that. all feel free to repeat things like that as well Thank you. um let's go to room three that's Arianne, Melissa, Miguel, and Priscilla. Okay, so I guess I'll say mine. <laughs> <laughs> or you can speak for the group, whatever you all would like to do. I didn't give any formal rules. The group was pretty quiet, so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm the one with the big mouth, so I will speak up. <laughs> um, Recently on campus, I've been dealing a lot with um, Native American people and not being included. Um, so I want to do a sign about uh, having a voice, equality, first people, identity, uh, perseverance, living culture. Words with a couple of symbols, but I'm not sure if it fits in with the Bauhaus or the postmodern design. Because it's pretty simple when it, you know, to get the point across, it's more like the bolding words. Yeah. But you, I'm not sure. You could go either way. I would say if it's, and there's a lot of like in postmodernism, as you start looking, you uh -huh. can, there's still things that are pretty bold and it's not always like that grungy, like collage look. So just look at lots of different examples. And as long as you have like a source point, mm -hmm. um, but if you're going with Bauhaus, then yeah, it's very, it's limited, distinctive, and just pay attention to the structure. It's very structured, whereas postmodernism is kind of broken down and layered and, and stuff in there a little bit more. Because I was, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was originally going to go with a Bauhaus because of the, how the Black Lives Matters poster, that's kind of the idea that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the postmodern is talking about more about you know, there's a, there's a reason for it. Yeah. So that's why I wasn't sure. I feel like you're capable of doing either. <laughs> I, from based on, from what you've been talking about from the beginning of this course, I feel like this is your, this is your time to shine. This is your assignment. Area. So <laughs> just go for it. And, you know, let me know if you need technical support, because okay. I feel like you're probably one of the students that's like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do for this. So if you know, if you have your idea, I can always help you get to the execution part of it. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. We'll move to group four, room four, Brianna, Martinez, Mallory, and Star. I feel like, I don't know if Mallory wants to go. I don't know. I like her idea if she stuck with that main thing Mallory. yeah I can, yeah i can share <laughs> i don't care um i'm gonna do modern or postmodern, and then women's rights 
um I like doing I like the collage look so I'm kind of excited to kind of like mess around with that awesome but yeah we were kind of just all talking about um what historical um time we wanted to go with like of the designs so that's pretty much what we were like discussing cool yeah I know it can be tricky to pick one and then some like I said, people always gravitate towards certain ones. And then it's like, oh, this is like, maybe it's harder to execute than I thought. So you can always email me and let me know, like, this is what I want to do, but I'm having trouble getting there. But then you're also open to doing it however you'd like to do it. So collage, like I said, you can literally collage it if you're having trouble with the computer make a bunch of cheap copies and cut your stuff out and like paste it up if you want to, or you can do a, the exact same thing in Photoshop and learn how to get that pin tool or those lassos and cut things up and, and layer them over the top of each other. So you have a lot of creative freedom in this assignment. The two biggest hurdles I see every semester are just trying to narrow down a topic that you feel like you can execute in, in a similar style. So um, I gave you eight really good examples. And then I've just seen, there's been some really clever ones over the years um, of things too that you didn't really expect. Like early on, I think it was maybe 2019, there was one that had like illuminated manuscript, but it was like a portrait of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I just thought that was really funny. Um, because it's those like the dissonance, the juxtaposition of the style. So you can either go with something where it's like, uh, like women's rights and Art Nouveau seem to fit. They're both feminine and there's that natural connection there, or you can like juxtapose those, which means like they don't seem to fit. And that's what makes it, um, an interesting choice. So, uh, oh, I saw a hand up, but then I lost it. Let me scroll. Brianna. Hi, yeah, I just had a question. Um, I chose my topic, but I kind of am struggling with deciding um, like what historical to go with. Um, I chose global, um, like climate change. Uh huh. That's kind of what I chose to go with. Um, but I don't really have an idea in my head. Like I was kind of looking on like different art things like on Google and kind of trying to come up with an image of like what I could go off of. But what do you think would be the best art to use? So I would focus on what you think you can execute really well. Um, I've had that topic in almost all of the styles. So I think in the module, in the assignment, yeah, the Save the Oceans, that's essentially climate change. Um, and it's done in the Bauhaus. And then um, I remember when I was looking through these, there was an Art Nouveau style one. And it was um, just because the ocean's really flowing and organic. Uh, you can use photography. So that one used photography, but then framed up a picture of the ocean and made sure all the typography and that frame had that Art Nouveau sense of style. So you can do things like that. Like if, if it makes sense. And like I said, it doesn't have to be every single element. You just have to find that pattern or that connection back to it somehow. So because Art Nouveau didn't use type of, or photography, you can still use it if you choose to um, just make sure there's some other connection there in it. Does that make sense? That was a long answer for that. So, yeah, so yeah, I'm not sure you could really do climate change for any style. Is there one that you just like when you look at it mo most? Uh... So funny because I, I like them all but I know like one would be a little difficult like I don't want to do Art Nova I don't think I don't even want to try because I don't <laughs> I don't want my feelings to get hurt and I don't want to feel defeated I don't so I'm just gonna just take the L I'm okay I really I think, am. I think being honest with yourselves in this assignment is a great place to start so that's wonderful um yeah so I would say maybe lean towards Bauhaus or postmodernism and just see what what goes and you know spend some time looking uh I think I even put a link to a textbook in the module 
if you really wanted to look at more history of graphic design. And, and again, if you feel really drawn to something that I didn't list out of the four, we can have a discussion about it. But I gave you four really good distinct choices. Um, okay, four. I know there was a, the Art Nouveau, Bauhaus. Illuminated Manuscript, Bauhaus, and Postmodernism. So, oh, okay. Illuminated Manuscript, I will be honest, it's done the least often. <laughs> it's very <laughs> intricate and ornate. But a lot of students who tend to choose it do it because you can do it by hand and accomplish something rather similar. Because I was um, thinking maybe doing cubism. But because okay. it's like, I'm like, that seems like simple enough with the skills, but it's like easy to expand upon kind of thing. So I was going to say that right before breakout room, Danielle uh, sent a link of art movements that are, it's a really good resource and it um, has a lot of art movements linked in. A lot of those do follow design movements as well. Um, so just kind of be... Like if there's something like that, that you like, like I just scrolled through and it landed on surrealism. That's not necessarily a movement in graphic design, but you could adopt that style into your design aesthetic. So again, going back to week one, art and design are very connected. So if there's something like that, that you're really drawn to and you wanna go for it, you just have to have the information and the principles and elements of design reasons to back it up. But I think you've all got a good grasp on it. Um, that's really, that's what this week is about. Fully creative freedom so that you can really focus on analysis and just understanding uh, how to pull apart a style and recreate it in your own way. Do you have any other questions about this week and the assignment? I have an idea, but I'm not sure how to relate it to one of the um, the the one of the design choices. Yeah, do you want to share it? I was thinking something along the lines of like um, challenges as a first generation of college graduate, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure like which one might fit the most or the best. So, okay, so let's, this will be a good exercise for us. So when you picture that as, as your topic, you're a first generation college student, what are some of the real challenges that you have as a first generation college student? So you could start off by bullet journaling and like list those like challenges and then think about what part of that you really want to communicate. So what part of that from that brainstorming list is the overall message? Does that, does that make sense? So you might uh, pull out something from that list and then that could be your headline. Or maybe you're looking at that list and it's like, these are all really important things that I want to hit. So you go with postmodernism and like jam all that stuff in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah okay that that like really sparked something okay cool modernism yeah. yes all right and thank you postmodernism is a great one it can work for almost anything and you can just jam it full of like if you don't want to edit yourself then go with postmodernism if you want to draw go with illuminated manuscript if you want to do something clean and simple and be really precise that's Bauhaus does that help yes so much thank you okay, you're welcome um okay so then that is it this is a pretty quick lecture for tonight and it was way less weird than last week <laughs> less interruptions um this link that danielle shared i should put on discord so we don't lose it um if you want to do that that is a really good link for art styles um and then yeah just google what you pick research it, look at lots of different designs. And then I will still stick around to answer questions about last week if you've had technical issues. And then um, that'll be due on Monday. So you have more time since I forgot to upload the videos for everyone to follow along with. So if you've got that and you've already, you're one of those people that already turned it in, you're free to go for the night and I will be here for questions. And remember, we're being observed next week. So turn in your assignments and 
be really happy about class. <laughs> Hey, Arianne, first up, your hands up. Okay, can I share my screen? Absolutely. Okay. So this is where I started and I got stuck. Okay, okay, so what were you trying to do? Did you want the orange to go behind that stem right there? I I wasn't really sure. And then I kind of, hold on one more thing. I kind of thought, I didn't know if I could do with the poppy Saturday because the poppy is the color. Sorry, I didn't follow that. <laughs> okay, hold on. Um, so I had originally, I had gone with this one afterwards because I was trying to thicken it up. So instead of orange Saturday, I went with poppy Saturday. Poppy but I did. color. I mean, people call salmon, salmon. Salmon. <laughs> I'll allow it. I, I'm allowing that. Um, okay. So, so yeah, you can go with that if you want to. So in Photoshop, you're having trouble with the layer masks. But, right. Okay. So I can show you a couple of things. Let me get some stuff pulled up to make it easier. Let me find something. I'll just take this picture. Okay. Did you just do a low opacity background eraser on the top layer? Uh, I think I was trying to help her out right before the class. Mm -hmm. I saw we she were... had her curves. Yeah. And then, so, so a layer mask can be used with anything essentially to just hide and show what you want to show. And the reason I push layer masks versus just erasing things is that it's non-destructive editing and it can be really useful. So you can go back and you, you're building on all of your layers. So let me screen share here really quickly. So I just pulled up this picture because it was on my desktop. Okay. This is an adorable child that is mine. <laughs> so you'll see here, I just duplicated this layer. Now, layer masks can be made automatically if you select one of these like levels or curves, what it's doing, it's making a mask for you already. And it just goes on top of whatever you're doing. So what Ariane had, she had curves on. Let me, just gonna select this. So I have the main, the figure in this image selected. And then if I hit mask, now the part inside of this, see is inside that mask. So, you can do things like this where you select that and then you hit curves and then you're just, in, just adjusting the curves of what's in that mask. So she had something like that going on, but you can also just duplicate layers. Like if I were to paste in type, Now it's a smart object. I didn't, I'll have to rasterize this if I'm going to delete it, but like, say I want this type to go behind the adorable child's head. See, it's waiting for libraries. That's what I was talking about last week when I just keep adding libraries haphazardly to my Photoshop because I paste things in. So this is that vector layer of the type I just brought in. I can add a mask to that. And now with my brush, so a layer mask works with black and white color and anything black is gonna be hidden and anything white is gonna show up. So now I can just take 
see I'm going to bump the opacity up. Oops. Then I can just paint around and it looks like it's behind the head. Now doing it this way, you have to really zoom in and get really precise. Or you can take, you know, the selection and then just fill that in. And now it looks like it's behind. So I don't know if that answers your question, but whatever you wanted to hide or like show, you just have to add the mask to it and then you can paint over the top of it in black or white. Did that help? Do you, we can show, you can share your exact screen and we can go over it if you'd like. Okay. Okay. I think it might be a little bit of a matter of undoing the work that I could help you do. Because this is, yeah, this is where we had. Yeah, so you've got the curves right there like I was doing, but uh -huh. you don't really need that. So you could just toss that in the trash, just drag it down to the trash icon. Uh, that's that's a whole other thing. I don't know what you're, that's. Okay, so just click over in your layers. See where it says curves one? Mm. Yes. Right on curves one, click, press, and drag it down to the trash. Down to the right, yep. Now you just deleted the mask because you were clicked on the mask. That's a good lesson. So if you hit okay. delete, you can, you can do that. And if you hit oh. delete, it'll just delete the mask and everything else will be dark from those curves because that's the mask and the curves is the whole thing. Okay, so the whole thing can get deleted then? The whole thing can get deleted, but that's what a layer mask does. It shows you uh, what you, like you're hiding and showing things of that particular layer. Aha, okay. So now I see you have. This is where the concern was because it wasn't coming out enough and I could tell on yours, you like, you kind of faded it out a little bit. Yeah, so if you zoom in there, will you zoom into orange? Mm -hmm. So we can see it all better. So if you want that, like, that I think it, it'll, it'll, the it'll, knee. it'll resolve it if I use a poppy <laughs> instead of the orange. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got orange in a thin tight face and you've uh -huh. got thin stems going across on the so back, that's right? Really intricate, like, coloring in there, but it's totally possible. So let's see what I'm confused about is that you have in you have your layer one with a mask on it that's completely white. So that means everything in that layer should show and you've got your poppies, but I can still see your typography. Can you click that layer off and on with the eyeball? Click the eyeball. Now click it back on. Nothing happens, huh? Uh -uh. Delete that. I don't know what it's doing. The, the whole thing should be over the orange, right? Oh, is that what it is? Okay, so it's got, but it should be all oh. black if that was functioning the way it was supposed to. So it should be hidden. Does that make sense? But it's all white, which means it's all showing up. Oh, see, there's something right here. Is it? No, no, it's not. Go ahead and zoom out and click that layer off and on again. Now click that layer off and on with the eyeball. Okay. Now click it back on. Just like toggle it back and forth a couple times. Yeah, I don't know what that layer is doing. So ideally, because it's all white, that means that whole layer should be showing up, but it, it seems to all be hidden. So just delete that one. Okay. Oh, see so you deleted the mask. Something was there. Delete the whole layer again. Oh, the whole thing? Oh, I see, I see. I figured out what you did. Okay. You have the opacity of that layer at zero. See up there? Oh, that's what we were, we were trying to do. Yeah. yeah, and see how as you bump it up, it's you're losing what's underneath it. That's okay. Go all the way to 100%. Okay. Now, it's gone. now click on the mask down below. Right here? Yep. Okay. Now get your paintbrush. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and this now, is what we were doing earlier, right? Yeah. Yeah, and now switch.
switch your color to black, you can just hit X to switch back and forth when you have your paintbrush selected and it'll switch it between black and white. There you go. Okay. Now zoom back in where you know poppy or orange is supposed to be. It's right here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now go over to the vector smart object layer. Which is over here? Yeah, yep. up a little bit. It's the middle part of the sample. Yeah, your middle layer that says vector smart object, one down. Over here. Now click on the, the square that shows that whole image. And when you click on it, hold down, hold on, let me get the right key command. Hold down, uh, okay, it's command on mine. Would that be option on a PC? Control. Control, hold down control and click right on that layer. Oh no, that took me somewhere else. So hold down so control. Not. But it took you, cause it's a smart object, so. Yeah, hit control and click on it. Okay. Didn't do what I wanted. Um, click right on the box. Hit rasterize right there. See where it says rasterize? Layer? Yeah, that'll just help us. Okay, okay. now hit control and click right on the middle of the square. Where it's checkered and has yeah, where it's the checkered. Text. Yeah, now click. Okay. There you go. See? Oh. So now jump up and click on that white box on the layer above. Okay. Now go over where um, with your uh, paintbrush and just brush over that. So where just you brush. Want yeah. Like that? Let's see. What don't you have set? Oh, see how it's coming up? Uh huh. Make your brush a little bit bigger. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, and just brush over. That's not working so much, huh? Yeah, it's real slow. I was looking at your opacity is 100. Yeah, I was looking at that too. I would make uh, it. Is it because of the hardness of the brush? Maybe it's. Too oh yeah and it's also lettering. like if you zoomed in you'd probably be able to see it better too like you could really make your brush big and just go stamp but what all you want to do right now mm -hmm. is you're just getting that to show back up so you could cover it again <laughs> oh my god so really what I should have had you do was turn that whole thing black and just done like a swipe over where, what you want it to cover. But oh it's, just, it's just the same thing. It's just which which thing you want to show. Okay, so so now. But now do you get how the layer mask works? Uh, kind of, not really. You just hid everything <laughs> in that top layer one poppy mask. Uh -huh. You just told that layer to hide everything that you paint it over. So honestly, if I were you and I was doing this, I would move my type up so that it goes over something big like a petal and then just like color over like a little bit of like the petal, you know? So you're moving right now, you're moving the whole, um, just hit undo really quick. And hit Command D or Control D. Okay. That'll deselect those marching ants. Um, and then just turn off layer one for a second. Select uh, the vector smart object layer with your orange Saturday. Uh, I don't know what that means. Oh, no, click on that layer. Right here. In the layers tool like yeah right oh you have the right tool so now you should be able to click on it and just move it around sorry wrong one make sure you're on the right the vector smart object layer yeah so now just move it up somewhere like right see it kind of it blends right in with the yeah move it over and then move it up a little bit right get the top of the d right under that bottom petal of that big flower. There you go. Now move it oh, right here. Right here. Right there. Right where you just had it. Go up a little bit more. And then down a little bit. 
<laughs> Perfect, right there. Just leave it right there. It's And you can do this differently if you want to later. Now turn on layer one again. Okay. Uh, turn it on so you can see it. Okay, so I want you to control click right in the middle of that whole layer on your layers palette. Control right here? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Hit command or control D. Okay. I want you to get that, see that square that looks like marching ants? This one? Yep. I want you to take that and while you're on that layer, just swipe over the whole thing and make a big square. Okay. There you go. Now go click on that white box next to layer one. That's the clipping mask or the, yeah, click, click on that. Now go up to edit, fill, and go up where it says contents mm -hmm. and go to foreground color and hit okay. Okay, so what we did is we hid that entire layer. Mm -hmm. So now hit control D again to get rid of those ants. Okay. And I want you to take your magnifying glass and zoom right into the top of that D. So now get your paintbrush again. Okay. And switch it to white. And just brush over where you think that petal would go. Perfect. And then you can make your brush smaller and you can kind of refine that. So go down to like 15? Yeah, whatever yeah. you And if like. you want to switch the brush to a hard pressure brush instead of the soft, then you'll have harder edges and you can be more accurate. So yeah. it's on that same, same selection. Uh -huh. And then just down below that hard pressure size, you see that right there? You can also right take, yeah, hardness right there, or you can pick different brushes. Yeah. And what would be a hardness number like? A hundred. That's the hardest. <laughs> it's like from zero to a hundred. Um, but that's going too far now, right? So now just hit X again. Okay. And then go back and color in. And you just keep repeating that till you like the way it looks until you think it looks like it should. It's supposed but, to. Okay. And that would be... And then you'd be done if you want to be. You're more than welcome to redo it with that other, with the poppy word, but uh -huh. this is how simple it could be if you want it to be. Okay. And now you kind of get how the layer masks work. Does that yes. feel awesome? I feel, be I feel better. Cool. <laughs> Not comfortable, but I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Guys. All right. Who has more questions? <laughs> I think I'm going to head out. I will probably message you. My eyeballs are starting to like, I, I'm trying to work on, on some stuff, but I'm like, I think my eyeballs just need a little break. All right. <laughs> All right. Night. Good night. Um, I have a question. It's not about the project, um, but I shot you an email because my coaches wanted us to get grade checks from all of our professors. Uh-huh. Um, so I sent you an email just like with a couple things that they wanted to know, if you don't mind checking that out in the next few days. I'm sorry. I just responded to that before class. Did you get it? Or oh, is... let me go check. Okay. <laughs> let me know. I'm sorry you stuck around just to ask that. Um, oh, no, no worries. Okay. We're learning along the way. So. Okay, good. <laughs> but I did uh, reply with it. But if there's anything else you need, just let me know. I got it. Thank you so much for doing that. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too. All right. Corey, do you have anything specific or you just like to hang out? I, yeah, I was just going to hang out and see if I could learn any more from other people's questions, if that's all right with them. Yeah, no, that's fine. Melissa? Um, yeah. Is level project three, do we have to submit part one and part two or only part two? You have to do both parts. It's two pages. Okay, so we have to submit both, right? Yeah. Okay, and part three, um, 
our design will be the one that we do the picture and then the words on top of it, right? Yeah, so you do the exact same thing, whatever you did for the first part where it's just in like a block of color, you just take that type and put it in a picture and then do like a little, the little Photoshop thing that we were doing. Yeah, because I don't get the, for the bottom part that it has the colors and then letters and, and numbers for part okay. two. So that would be you just showing me the colors that you picked. So we're just going back to the color theory aspect of it and you breaking down like what your color palette was. So if you're using RGB colors, for example, you would just list out like what that color was. So it would probably have, and you can give me the hexadecimal number. So you have to type less if you want. Do you remember where to find that? Do you want me to show you? Um, yeah, can you show me please? Yeah. What about, is, will it be only the colors that we use for the words or also the ones that are in the image? Um, don't worry about the image. No, that's like a, a bunch of colors. Just the what you use for the, the words in the first part. Okay, because um, there's only two colors. Is it fine? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so if you have this, see how this color is R255G77B255. Yeah. And then it has this hashtag. So it only be that? You could just put, you could list it like pound and then that, and then your second color, say it's black, which that is not the hexadecimal for black. So mine's not the true black. And you could list it like that. And then what I want, remember, is like the swatch breakdown. Okay, how do we do the swatch? So you can use your eyedropper and pick it. And remember, this should be an in, I'm actually doing this in Illustrator. I tell you to do it in InDesign. So if you were to do it in InDesign, you'd be dropping in your EPS file or your PDF that you saved that would be five by five. So you, just like that first assignment where you're pulling things into InDesign and then you make text boxes. So you can make a text box with that color code. And a text box with the other color code. And then a text box with your, this is why I picked these colors, blah, 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 blah. So you have all of these things on here, right? And if this was, whatever I pulled in my image, you can take these colors and actually copy them and paste them in InDesign if you want to, or you can get this eyedropper and pull your colors and then use squares in InDesign if you wanna do it that way. Okay, yeah, it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a quick question. How do you find the hex numbers on InDesign? I saw so, where to find them on. Yeah, so in InDesign, you'll open your swatches palette and you'll double click and it'll open swatch options. And then in, oh, it's, color okay. it's CMYK, since it's print layout software, you would just switch it to RGB and it'll be down here and then it'll be right here. And then InDesign will tell you, see the RGB versus the CMYK, it'll give you an icon. All right, is that, is that it? Yeah, that's it, thank you. You're welcome. Good night, everyone.